start the recording. Okay. Um, let me see. Any other questions? Okay. Can you explain the electron config again? How well, that's okay. That's like a whole um, lecture. Can you, um, Gabriel? Can you just give me something specific related to it? Like either a question on the homework or a specific question, example problem that you would want like me to walk through. Yeah, you don't have to remember a specific problem. If you want to just give an example of a problem, didn't have to match exactly what was on the homework, but just something you were not sure about. Okay, so I'm looking at 1S2. Uh, was, did I, was there, a, I don't think there was a problem on the homework with an SP2 orbital. Um, that's kind of a. Was there a question on there like that? I hope not, because that that's that's an advanced organic chemistry orbital. Um, okay, let me go. Hang on, let me see. Twenty-two. All right, let me go with twenty-two. Okay, 22. Okay. Okay. So what's the electron configuration of cobalt 2 plus? A little tip on these. Um, you can always tell the number of electrons by just adding up the uh, superscripts. Okay, so that helps with the process of elimination. So... Well, I would start with the problem like this is look at cobalt and also look at the charge. It's two plus. So that means it's a normal, you take a cobalt atom and remove two electrons. So if I look at the periodic table, all right, and cobalt is in position 27. Okay, let me just try. I'm going to share the, my whole screen so I can go back and forth between periodic table and homework problems. This will be a lot easier to do. Okay, let me share the screen. This will be a lot easier than sharing a specific window. Okay. All right, so we're sharing. Okay, so now going back to that. Okay, so we have cobalt 2 plus. So let me, I'm going to show you the, so we look for cobalt. So cobalt is element 27. So it means a normal cobalt atom would have 27 electrons, but it's a cobalt with a plus two charge. So that means it's lost two electrons. So it's going to have an electron configuration that's similar to manganese. Okay. So you can start with the periodic table and count through the electrons. So we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, because that's sodium magnesium, then we're in the 3p region, so that's 3p6. And then we start 4s2, and then we would be 3p1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Now, I did say last week that when elements in the third in this 
D region lose them, you normally first start and take electrons off the valence shell, which would be this 4S region. So in that case, you can actually take the electrons off the 4S, and then these electrons here would still remain. So you'd have nothing in the 4S shell, and then you would have the 3P region filled with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. Now, so you want to look for something along those lines. Okay, so we have here, so fortunately there's nothing for us to, so we can't eliminate it that way. But we want to look for something that at least shows 35 electrons, okay, because that's what would, cobalt would have. I'm sorry, 25 electrons. Okay, so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3 P6, 3D5. Okay, we haven't even started the 4S, so we can eliminate A. Here we have 1S, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D5. Okay, that that one looks good. Um, 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D9. Okay, so B looks like cobalt, except okay, it has the correct number of electrons. But remember what I said, when it becomes an ion, you're better off taking it off of the 4S before you do the 3D, 3Ds, because this is where the outermost electrons are. Okay, so B has the right number of electrons, but there might be an issue with the where the electrons were first removed in creating this ion. So C, we have 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D9. Well, this is really just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. They added electrons. Okay, so that's more like copper. Okay, so we're going to eliminate that one because that has too many electrons. So D, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d7. So here, they took off the 4s electrons. And they still have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So both B and D have the right number of electrons. And then E, we have one, two, two, S2, two, two P6, three, S2, three P6, three D nine. Okay. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So they actually took two electrons off and moved them down. So yeah, so this one doesn't even have this one. This one is actually doesn't really even have the right number of electrons, but doesn't match the configuration. So the two best options would be B or D. And B took the electrons off of the 3D shell, and D starts with the cobalt, but they took electrons off 4S. So since we want, when we're making an ion, we want to take electrons off the outermost layer, I would say D is the best choice. Okay. So, is their explanation. The element CO is a transition metal, meaning is in the D block and the fourth row because elements in the D block have quantum number N one less than the row on the periodic table. The electron configuration will end with 3D. So electron, so we start with a coal ion, which is here. Let me make this a little bigger. No, no never mind. Uh, let's okay, that's bigger. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d7. However, the cobalt 2 plus electron is two, far, two fewer electrons. So the electrons must be removed from the highest energy orbital. I, now, when they say the highest energy, technically 3d is higher energy. What they should have said in their explanation is they should remove it from the orbital with the 
from the valence shell, okay, which would be the 4S. Okay, because remember the off by diagram, 3D is technically higher, but we we always want to start removing it from the outermost layer, which would be the 4S. So then we end up with this electron configuration. So whenever you, so remember, whenever you're converting atom into an ion, start by rem removing the electrons from the outermost shell or valence shell then as you remove them go to to the higher energy levels okay so let's see go And okay, eight. Make it eight. Okay, so which element has the electron configuration of one S two, two P two S two, two P six, three S two, three P six, four S one, three D five. Okay. Um so this one will actually looks like it's one of those exceptions to the octet. I'm not exceptions to the octet rule, but it's one of the exceptions to the order of filling because we have a 4s1 and we put electrons to the 3d5. So normally, if you follow strict off-bar designations, you put atoms in the 4s orbital, then the 3d5. But there was a little corollary or an exception to the filling rule that says. When you are one short of either a half filled or fully shield filled D sublevel, you can take an S electron and drop it down into the D orbital to either half fill or completely fill it up. Okay, and that's what happened here. So if you look up the numbers, that will give us a clue. So 2 and 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10 plus 2 is 12, 18, and then 18 and 6 is 24. So we want to look for something with an element of 24. Okay, so that would be chromium. Okay, so we have chromium here. Um, this is an electron configuration. Um, so you do want to look for when you're looking at these things, you want to make sure that it's a it's a valid element in a ground state. Okay. Um, now, for E, no element had this configuration. That would be a case where they may they may have not been following the off-bar diagrams or the exceptions. So, for example, if you saw something with a um like it was a five S orbital being used and you hadn't f finished filling up the fourth shell, that would be an invalid configuration because it wouldn't be in the ground state. Or if you see something that just is impossible, like for example, a, a 2D orbital somewhere, okay? And we know D orbitals can only start in the third shell. That would be another example of something that's just invalid. Or if there were like too many, P if it's, it was like said 2P8, um, that would you know, I would make a qualification for something that's invalid, but so here it looks like it's a valid configuration. So we have that chromium. Okay, and that's the example. So so look at this. So remember the this is that little exception when five and the three D five normally indicates that corresponds to the fifth entry in the row. The four S shell is only half filled with one electron instead of two. If the 4S electron would fill, were filled, it would take an electron from the 3D orbital. So 4S1, 3D5 would change to 4S3, 3D4. Okay, and this would correspond to the fourth element in that row, which is chromium. And the reason the electron configuration ends with 4S1, 3D5 instead of 4S2, 3D4 is that having two half filled orbitals 
is more stable than having one partially filled and not exactly half filled. So this is that exception where you, if you can drop an electron from the S shell and either by doing that half fill or full, fully fill the D sub level, it will be more stable that way. That, that was one of the exceptions to the orbital filling. Okay. Okay, any other homework questions? Okay. So some of you got in those talked about the test. So on I posted the homework for what I'm going to cover tonight. And at the end of the week, probably I'm shooting for Thursday, I'll post the, the two parts of the exam. The one part will be the time portion, which will basically be very similar to what we had for the last exam. So it would be timed, certain number of questions, and a certain amount of time to finish it. And then I'll have another part two, which will be the untimed portion, which will be more um, problem-based, less uh, multiple choice. And that will, and again, you, you, that, that's not, that's, you don't have a, a timed amount for that part, but it, both of them will have to be completed by the following Wednesday, because after that, just have them graded and get all the exams in by uh, Thursday. So I'll post them on this Thursday, and also I'll do an optional review session on Thursday starting at 7, um, just regular time. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the queue tonight. So I'm not going to present any new material. I'm just going to see if people had questions on the homework and from the for this week, and then I'll, before you start the exams. Okay, uh, Lena, you, is that you referring to a problem? You said W thirteen. Oh, date. Okay. Yeah, it'll be yeah the yeah Wednesday the thirteenth. Okay. Okay, so it'll be like I think I'll post. I'll make it. I'll by the I'll have it due by the end of the day on the thirteenth. Okay. So just make sure you have it in by then. Um, yeah, and all these just when you're doing the exams, there's no penalty for guessing wrong. So. Um, if you have no idea, try even if it's a multiple choice, try to eliminate some of the wrong choices and guess. I'm not penalizing for wrong guesses. Um, um, like if you if you have multiple choices, four choices, you can eliminate two, and yet your odds of getting it right just went from one out of twenty-five to one out of fifty, fifty uh, percent, uh, I think. Mean. So um, yeah, don't don't when you don't leave blank answers on the exams because it's it's you, you're guaranteeing you're going to get it wrong. But if you can eliminate choices and guess. Make sure you do that. Okay, um, let me let's go to the new stuff for tonight. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually share the screen again because I want to. I'm gonna be going back and forth between Chem 101, which has a little interface for drawing molecular models. And let's see. Let me find. Notes for tonight. Okay, so these are all available on the queue as well. All right, so let me just double check, make sure people can still see. Okay, good. Okay, so tonight we're going to continue from what we've learned so far about electron orbitals 
and how that allows us to determine molecular geometry and polarity. Okay, so I want to be able to be able to design and predict the shapes of molecules and also pre predict the polarity of a molecule. Now, a polar molecule is a molecule that has a charge differential. So one side of the molecule has a slight positive charge and the other side has a slight negative charge versus a nonpolar, which both sides have equal charges. Okay, so some of the same basic skills we're going to be doing. Um, so we're going to start with electron dot symbols. So this is a simplified way of drawing atoms. Okay, now electron dot symbols are really focusing on valence electrons. And so when we're talking about valence electrons, we only really are referring to the outermost electrons that are in either the s or p orbitals. So you typically going to be see them in sets of 1 through 8 when we're talking about valence gels because that's 8 is the most uh, you can electrons you can have in s and p orbitals. So sometimes you'll see electrons together like this and when they're shown together that like this, that just indicates you have two electrons that are in the same orbital. Okay, so this could be referring to a specific S or P orbital, and then these three are single electrons in orbitals by themselves. Okay, so for reasons I'm not, I don't want to get into, um, you'll see that when you start to electron dot symbols, they're not going to always strictly follow the off-bar ordering filling rules of putting two electrons in an S orbital then the rest of the electrons in P orbitals. Um, it has to do with a little bit of more complicated le level of uh, orbital structure that we call orbital hybridization. So you'll see some electron dot diagrams. They'll still have between one and eight electrons, but they won't completely sync up with what you would normally expect for a um, S and P orbitals, the way they're filling up. Particularly if if it's if you're not representing a single atom, but you're representing an atom that's bonded. So when you talk talk about bonding electrons, you have a whole different set of orbitals that are based upon the S and P orbitals, but they they're called uh, bonding orbitals, and they have slightly different structures than the normal sp orbitals which were really orbitals just for single lone atoms um then you won't really get into that bonding orbitals until you take like a full year chemistry course or even and then you get even more detailed if you ever go into an organic chemistry course okay so electron dot diagrams we're just really focusing on s and the first eight electrons in the outermost shell as just a simplified version of representing it and it provides a tool to help us predict the structure of molecules and bonds. So here's an example of the electron dots of representative elements. Okay, so these are the first two columns and the last six columns of the periodic table. And you'll notice here they all seem to follow a very similar pattern. Okay, the first column, groups 1A, just have one electron. Okay, it doesn't really matter if you put it in the 3 o'clock position or 12 o'clock or when, it, that's irrelevant. Um, they just happen to put them all in the 3 o'clock position here, but you could put them in any position. Okay, we these ones have two electrons. Now, they're normally shown separate from each other at this point, but whether or not they're, again, whether the second one's in the 12 o'clock or 9 o'clock or 6 o'clock, it really doesn't matter. As long as the two electrons, and traditionally they're shown separate. 
okay, is the group 3A with three electrons and group 4A with four electrons. And again, there's four electrons and they're all separate from each other. Once you start to get to group 5A with normal electron dots, we start to pair them up. Okay, so we put electrons in NP orbitals. Then once these orbitals are filled, we start pairing them up. Okay, so now we have two electrons in this orbital, and we have three empty half-filled orbitals. And for six, we have two pairs and two single electrons. And then we have, for seven, we have three pairs and a single electron. And then for the noble gases, we have eight electrons or four pairs. And remember, each pair is just two electrons in a single orbital. Okay. It's not following the same rules as we put electrons in the s orbital first, pair them up, then fill up the p orbitals. It doesn't necessarily follow that rule because, again, we're talking about how electrons behave there in bonds, and bonding orbitals have slightly different modified rules. It's not the same orbitals that you would see when you have single atoms by themselves. They are similar, but they're not the same. Okay, so why we left off with the noble gases, neon, argon, krypton, and helium. As remember, helium is only a in the first row of the periodic table, and that row can only hold two electrons. So helium is filled up with two electrons, which would be the two electrons in an s orbital. Okay, so electron dot formulas, okay, can either show the sequence of bonded atoms in either a molecule or a polyatomic ion. So it's another it's another type of chemical formula, but in this case, we're showing the structure of the atom and the electrons that make up the valence shell of that of the atoms in that polyatomic ion or molecule. So we're going to show bonding pairs of electrons and non-bonding or unshared lone pairs of electrons and the central atom bonds to the atoms. Okay, so here's an example for water. So oxygen normally has six valence electrons. And hydrogen atom has one. So we have two hydrogen atoms, and they're sharing electrons with oxygen. So these, these two electrons between the H and O atom are being shared between these two atoms. And that's what we call a covalent bond. Okay, it's a bond created between two atoms when they're sharing electrons. We have the same thing on this other side, another covalent bond. Now, sometimes you'll see the water molecule drawn at an angle. They're both valid for when you're doing electron dot diagrams. Um, it's really just an issue of perspective and what angle you're visualizing the projection of the molecule at. So sometimes you'll see this drawn straight. Sometimes you'll see it drawn at an angle. Really? It's a projection of a three-dimensional structure on a 2D surface, so the angles may not are not going to match up what you'll see in the angles in a three-dimensional model. Okay, it's not meant to be that. It should show it because you you're gonna when you project a two-dimensional a three-dimensional structure on a two-dimensional surface, information is lost. Okay, so so that's okay. So that's an example of. Uh, water molecule. And notice in this, we have two sets of electron, two pairs of electrons that aren't bonded on the top and the bottom, and a pair of electrons that's bonded here and a pair of electrons bonded there. And that, but make note of that because that's going to be important when we start looking at molecular geometry. Okay, so here's a kind of a simplified rule for drawing electron dot formulas. 
Um, there are some more complicated rules that have to do with formal charges when you're dealing with more complicated atoms. I want to just start with the, the simple rule because this is as much we can cover in like a single lecture. So simple for, rule for just drawing your basic electron dot formula. This is determine the arrangement of the atoms and determine the total number of valence electrons and then attach each bonded atom to the central atom with a pair of electrons and then place the remaining electrons using single or multiple bonds to complete the octets. Okay, so we we'll want to draw the electron dot form of a PCL3 phosphorus trichloride used to prepare insecticides and flame retardants and determine the arrangement of the atoms. The central atom is P and there is only one P atom. So I'm going to go over to the Chem 101 page. And this is actually a handy little tool that you all have access to. And I'll help you actually draw molecular diagrams. All right. Let's see. Where was I? Okay. This and here. Okay. So. Some of the homework problems will automatically have this interface, but you all have access to this free drawer utility, which is really helpful in drawing atoms. So I'm going to just reset. And we, the example was PCL4. CL3, I'm sorry. Uh, let me see a question. Okay, that was just a comment. Okay, so if I look for phosphorus, okay, phosphorus is group 15, so that's also, you can also think of that as group 5A. These are, This row has five valence electrons, and Cl chlorine has seven. Okay, so. We're going to. Okay, so let's. Let me just take this electron and give it its five electrons. And actually, I'm going to take off the bonds too. P and okay. okay, and phos this second element over here is chlorine, so I'm gonna make just make it a chlorine. And the phosphorus is gonna actually have three bonds on it. So it's P, Cl3. And I'm going to make all these chlorines. Okay. So normal now phosphorus normally would have seven. I'm sorry, five electrons. Okay, so going back to the periodic table, phosphorus is here, one, two, three, four, five. So right now, each of these lines represents a pair of electrons. So right now, around phosphorus, I only have one, two, three pairs. Okay, so I'm going to add around the phosphorus, not the chlorine, another pair of electrons. Okay, so right now, the phosphorus has two electrons here, and then one, two, three electrons that's sharing with the three chlorines. Okay, 
Now each of these is a single bond, but each bond contains two electrons being shared. Now the chlorines is a halogen, so the chlorines are going to have seven electrons. So one, so that's already has one, two. Okay, so now the chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, because this line represents two electrons being shared. One comes from the chlorine, one comes from the phosphorus. Now I'm going to do the same thing for this other one. And for the third one. Okay. So what we have here is phosphorus trichloride. Now, phosphorus has one, two, three, four, five electrons. Three chlorines have normally have seven. Two, four, six, and one is seven. So what you want to check for now when you have the electron dot diagrams is make sure you didn't add or take away any electrons. So the three chlorines have seven electrons, so that's 21, and the phosphorus has five, so that should be 26. So if I count them, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. So the structure has the right number of electrons. So what we have now is a valid possible structure for phosphorus trichloride. All right, so let me go back to the slides. So usually when you're looking at these electron dot diagrams, the first element list will many times will be the central atom, particularly if you have a bunch of atoms that are the same. Usually you're going to think of those as external. Now, the book will go into a more detailed explanation using a concept called formal charge, um, where you calculate the charge on each of the atoms, and you'll determine that the most stable electron structure is the structure that has the lowest formal charge. Now, In doing formal charge, you're basically calculating the charge of the atoms as if they were ions. Okay. So in this case, the formal charge is zero. Okay, you can actually click this and see it shows you the formal charge. It's basically you're adding up the number of electrons around each atom subtracted from their the number of protons they have. And it, and you can't get lower than a formal charge of zero, so this is the most stable structure. Okay. So, Here's our arrangement, okay, again, we have the central P atom, we have the three chlorines around it, and you can either represent the bonds as two electrons drawn in between or as a single line, okay, remember a single line is a single bond, which is two electrons being shared between those two atoms. So then, as a sanity check, okay, you want to make sure that you have the correct number of electrons in the model, and you have octets. Okay, so um, we add in the remaining 20 electrons around the atom, and when we do that, okay, we see that the three chlorines 
have complete octets because they have eight electrons around it, counting the, the ones that are being shared. And the phosphorus has eight electrons. It has five of its own, then it gets three more from the shared bond. So it gives us this electron dark diagram of PCL3. So the key thing is when you're drawing these diagrams, you want to make sure that you have complete octets and you have the correct number of electrons. Okay, and the electrons is you're just going to add up the valence electrons of all the uh, atoms in the bonds. Okay, questions so far? And again, I would suggest you using this tool for, th for working through the problems. Okay, so questions. Okay, where, where, where is the tool? So if you log into the chem site, let me go back to the student view. Okay, so this is normally what you would see. So on the homework problems, it'll automatically bring up that interface for certain problems, but if you always want to just go to it directly, in this upper corner, okay, you want to click free, okay, and that will provide you with the interface. Okay, so from here, you just, you can click on a particular atom and give it, the right number of valence electrons, um, number of bonds. Now there are exceptions to the octet rule, so it, it allows you to have more than four bonds in certain cases. And then changing the element. Okay. Now changing the element just puts a label on the sphere. It doesn't actually set up any rules, so you could have a carbon with more than eight electrons, even though that's not really a correct, it gives you, allows you to do things that normally aren't possible, but because the change the element just changes a label. Okay. Um, and then you can even build more complicated models. So if I want to do like CH4, I could add, I could take this, add, um, Okay, so I could do a CH4 if I wanted to uh, make uh, something. I want to make, uh, let's see, let me add another bond here. Let's see if I want to add two electrons here. I think it, it doesn't doesn't actually allow you to it doesn't distinguish between single double and triple bonds it's kind of a new feature but it'll still allow you to do the bond geometry so these lines could possibly represent double single triple bonds it doesn't distinguish between them in this order so I don't see so there are some limitations to this it, it's kind of take the place of a a, mo a modeling kit. All right. Um, okay, so this one, write the electron dot for formula for ClO3. Okay. So this is going to be a little trickier. Chlorine has seven electrons, and oxygen has six. So, and because it's a polyatomic ion, this negative indicates we're going to have to give it one more electron. Okay, so it has one more electron than normally you would think of for CLO3, because it's an ion. So. 
again, we want to just start by determining the arrangement of the atoms. And the central atom is chlorine, and there's only one chlorine atom. And usually that's a good rule of thumb to follow. Um, usually the, the odd atom is going to be in the center, and the three oxygens are on the side. Okay, so I flip over to the tool again. We'll start with that. Okay, so let's say we'll make this chlorine, and we'll make that oxygen. Okay, we'll make we'll have three oxygens. No, around the three oxygens around the chlorine. So I looked chlorine, and let's make these all oxygens. And I'm going to take on a, take off one of the bonds. Okay, so I have three bonds, and I make that oxygen again. Okay, so we have a chlorine in the center and three oxygens around it. Okay, we'll start with that. So right now we've only put in two, four, six electrons that are being shared. So we want to determine the total number of valence electrons. So chlorine is in the group 7A, so it has seven electrons. Oxygen has six, so there's 18 around the oxygen. And then we have an ionic ion with one more. Okay, so we actually have a total of 26 electrons to put around this at this atom, oh, atoms, I should say. Okay, we can't have more than 26, and we can't have less than 26. We have to have exactly 26, and we also want to have um, be following an octet rule. So this chlorine looks like it should have two more electrons, okay, because it normally has seven, one, two, four, six, so we should give it two around the chlorine, so I give it two more electrons. Okay, so right now chlorine has two, four, six, eight, so it's stable, and the whole structure has eight electrons, okay, we need 26. So oxygen normally has six electrons. So I have already have one of the electrons on the oxygen. So I'm going to add more electrons on oxygen. OK. So right now, this oxygen has one, two, three, four, six electrons. OK. And this oxygen is one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. And this oxygen is one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. OK. Now. Starting there, something doesn't look quite right. Okay. So I want to have 26 electrons. Okay. So right now, I only have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23. So now I'm going to add 24. 25 and 26. Okay. So right now, I have the correct number of electrons in this structure, and I'm following the octet rule because all the electrons have the correct number of atoms in it. 
Now you normally think, well, chlorine normally wouldn't form three bonds because normally chlorine starts out with seven valence electrons. But in this case, let me start with the chlorine. I'm going to take these off again. Okay. So chlorine normally, you usually think of chlorine as just having three lone pairs of electrons and one being shared. Okay. And oxygen, we normally think of as having six electrons. So normally you think of a chlorine oxygen that will two electrons are being shared with the oxygen and then this oxygen has one left over. Okay. And it would ne normally need to share that way. But the electrons don't care where they come from. There's no sign on the electron saying, I, I'm an electron from chlorine or I'm an electron from oxygen. So it's possible to make a covalent bond with one atom giving two electrons and the other atom giving none. And as long as those two electrons are still being shared evenly, the electrons don't care where they came from. So I could make a three more bonds on this chlorine or two more bonds in this case by having chlorine give the electrons to oxygen. So if I add another bond here, in this case, the chlorine is going to give two electrons to the oxygen. And the oxygen would normally start off with one oh, electrons on with six. Okay, so in this case, here are two these original six electrons that are on the oxygen, and this bond here was caused by both electrons from the chlorine being shared. I'm going to do that again here. So I'm going to add another oxygen here. But in this case, these two electrons are going to be shared completely between the chlorine and the oxygen. And you have, this oxygen is not going to donate any. So I'm going to take this chlorine. I'm going to give it another bond. And I'm going to use two of those electrons in the bond like that. So I just replaced the two electrons on chlorine with this single covalent bond, this oxygen. And now the oxygen would have two, three, four, five, six electrons. So this case, okay, this is the covalent bond between chlorine and oxygen. Well, oxygen donated none of the electrons, and the chlorine donated both of them. And the same thing over here. Now, are we following the octet rule? Well, yes. So right now, in this structure, I have two. Chlorine has one, two, three, four. Originally had two, four, six, and seven because we said one of the bonds, the chlorine and oxygen, both donated one. And this oxygen has six. This oxygen has six. And this oxygen is, is different because it, this is actually sharing one of its electrons with the chlorine, but then it has one left over. So right now, this is what normally... I would have if I could make a chlorine trioxide molecule. Okay. But remember, this is a polyatomic ion. So there's one, I have to add one extra electron. And we can see right here there's a spot where that extra electron could go. So I'm going to add electron to this oxygen here. Now that means by doing that, I have more electrons than I have than the, the, the protons and the chlorine and the three oxygens. But that's fine because this is a polyatomic ion and it has a negative one charge. By adding that an extra electron, I gave it one charge and that accounts for all 26 electrons. 
Okay. That's, that's just another way of thinking through it, problem. But as a rule of thumb, as your final sanity check, you want to make sure that you have the correct number of valence electrons in your structure. So, and you're following the octet rule. So in this case, it looks like the chlorine is happy because it has either by sharing or its lone pair eight electrons, two, four, six, eight. The oxygen is, each of the oxygens have eight electrons around it, counting the electrons being shared from this single bond. So we have a stable electron configuration. Now, if I look at the formal charge, Chlorine has a formal charge of 2, and the three oxygens have a formal charge of negative 1. That's just done by counting all the electrons around it. And if, if electrons are being shared, we count them as half value. And if electrons are being shared, we count them as 1. So as a result, the three oxygens have a charge of negative one, and the chlorine has a charge of plus two. Okay. And we add up all the formal charges, we had actually we had the whole model of formal charge of which is actually the charge of it's supposed to have, which is the charge of the polyatomic ion. Okay. All right, so the those two examples I showed were single bonds. Now, you can have cases where you can have multiple bonds formed between two pairs of atoms, okay? And so that case, you can actually have one, two, or three pairs of electrons being shared. So in a single bond, we have one pair of electron is shared. In a double bond, two pairs of electrons are being shared. In a triple bond, three pairs of electrons are being shared. So when you draw them out, you're just going to show a pair of lines between the two. So here's an example of carbon dioxide. OK, in carbon dioxide, octets are being shared by sharing two pairs of electrons between atoms, and that's going to be a double bond. So let's see if we can make it with the utility. OK, so let me reset. Let's see, I'm going to have get rid of the charge, and I'm going to have one of these a carbon. And we have an oxygen. And we have another oxygen. No, wrong element. Oh, sick in the eight two. Is it gonna let me do it? It's not let me. Okay. One of the. Uh, let me just see if this. It looks like it's not allowing me to make double bonds, which is, oh, wait, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, okay, here we go. This is how we do it. You got the bond and then, okay. So let me, we'll make them both just single and just start out from the original formula. 
and I'll just get rid of the electrons for now. Okay, so for our carbon dioxide, we have carbon in the center and oxygen on the side. Okay. So normally these two oxygen atoms would have uh, six electrons around it. So I'm going to give each of these oxygen six more. Okay. So here, the carbon, the oxygen has six electrons, and it's also gotten a pair from carbon and a pair from carbon here, because carbon normally has four. So it's donated two electrons to this oxygen, two the electrons to this oxygen, forming a double bond. So right now, this diagram has the correct number of electrons. Okay, carbon dioxide. We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, which is the correct number of electrons in carbon dioxide if we count the valence electrons. Okay, oxygen has 6, carbon has 4. Okay, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay, 16 electrons. Anyone see a problem with this center carbon here, as it is written? Think of the octet rule. How many electrons are around that carbon atom? I go. four. Okay. So since it has four, that carbon isn't stable. It's not a stable electron configuration because we want, in, when we form a molecule, we want to have eight. So what we're going to do is this oxygen is going to donate and share another pair of electrons with this carbon atom. Okay, so when it does that, I'm going to take away a pair of electrons. I, what I'm going to do is make another bond from that pair of electrons. So what I've made is a double bond here. So this oxygen still has a full octet because it's just sharing the electrons, but shared electrons still count as the octet rule. So this is one, two, or I should say two, four, six, eight. So this oxygen is now still satisfied. I'm going to do the same thing for the other side. So I'm going to make take two of these electrons off the oxygen and make a double a second bond with that, which we'll call that a double bond. So I'm going to take off the two electrons and make this bond a double bond. Okay. Now, this carbon has eight electrons on it. Two, four, six, eight. The oxygen has two, four, six, eight. This oxygen has two, four, six, eight. So I've satisfied that rule and I have the correct number of electrons, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So in this case, without having, without adding or taking away electrons, I was able to, by making a double bond, I was able to allow carbon to satisfy the octet rule. Okay. So this ends up being the structure for carbon dioxide. So again, I found these, I identified the central atom and put the bonds around it. And then I added all the additional electrons. And then I, if I had it, if the, I still didn't have the octet rule satisfied, I adjusted 
the single bonds and move lone pair electrons into bonds and either making them double or sometimes triple bonds. So that's what happened here. And as a result, I've satisfied the octet rule for all three of them. Now here's a different example, nitrogen. Now nitrogen normally has five valence electrons. So let me reset this. I'm going to go to nitrogen. We're going to make this two nitrogens that are going to be bonded together. Okay, so I have two nitrogens and I want to bond them together. A nitrogen normally has five electrons. Five. There we go, five electrons, okay. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now I have one pair being shared here. Okay. So right now I haven't satisfied the octet rule. Okay. So what if I take a pair of electrons and make them a double bond? Okay. I didn't. I just moved the electrons around. I didn't add or take any away, so I'm not changing the charge. I still haven't satisfied the octet rule because now this nitrogen has eight electrons, two, four, six, eight, but this nitrogen needs another pair. It says two, four, six. So I'm going to make, take this pair of electrons and make a triple bond. So I'm going to go to this nitrogen take off two electrons and make and move them to the bond and make a double bond a triple bond now each nitrogen should have come into this molecule with five electrons and I, it doesn't have a charge so there should still be five times two electrons which uh, if we count two four six eight ten Five times two is 10. I have the correct number of electrons. And I've satisfied the octet rule. This nitrogen now has eight electrons around it. Two, four, six, eight. The same with the other nitrogen. So this N2 bond involves a triple bond between the three, two, three nitrogen, I'm sorry, the two nitrogens. Okay. Now, just a little background. This is um, a lot of explosives like dynamite um, involve nitrogen. And usually they, they start with a compound that contains nitrogen. And as a result of the combustion, it's forming N2 with a triple bond. And triple bonds are very strong bonds. And when triple bonds form, they release a large amount of energy. So you'll find in many explosives, a lot of the energy comes from nitrogen atoms combining with themselves to make triple bonds, and it releases a large amount of energy. And nitrogen takes is very nitrogen is very difficult to break down. In fact, nitrogen is a very important element in the body. Okay, we there's nitrogen DNA, there's nitrogen in proteins, okay, the amino group and amino acids comes is from nitrogen. But our bodies are not able to extract nitrogen from the air and use them into DNA and proteins. There's only one organ type of bacteria on earth that's actually able to extract nitrogen from the air. Okay, it's called it's a set of bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria. There's no other life form that can take nitrogen from the air and incorporate it into DNA and proteins. And so without that 
type of bacteria, there would not be life on exit life would not exist because there's no other organism that's capable of taking nitrogen from the air and building biological molecules from it. So every other form of life from plants to animals has to get nitrogen from other organisms. And it starts a cycle from bacteria. Okay, these nitrogen fixing bacteria actually live on roots of plants and they're able to pull nitrogen from the air or from the soil and incorporate it and give it to these and or other plants and that and then other animals and herbivores will eat the plants and they get get those nitrogen compounds in their bodies and then it goes throughout the food chain so even though nitrogen is such an important molecule element in bodies is only one type of bacteria that's able to get the nitrogen from the atmosphere. Okay. Questions so far. Let me switch to the board. Let me just see if there are any other questions. Okay, nothing up. All right, so let me go on. Okay. I've talked about resonance structures before, probably in, in chapter two. So resonance structures are molecules or polyatomic ions that can have more than one possible electron dot formula. And the structure, the two structures are, in terms of their energy, identical. Okay. Now there's a rule in quantum mechanics that states if you cannot predict with any certainty whether one of or two possible combinations will exist for an atom or molecule, then they both will occur, have equal likelihood of occurring. So common basic molecule that has a resonance structure is O3. Now O3 is just three oxygen atoms bonded together. Okay. So let me I'll show you how this looks again in the diagram. Okay. So I Go to back to the chem utility. And we're going to make O3. So I need three oxygens. One, two, And the oxygens have six valence electrons, so I, my model, I need 18. Okay, so I have two, four, so I'm going to just add more electrons. Six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Sixteen, eighteen. Okay, so just as a double check, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. So I have the right number of ox at electrons. Now, if you look at this, this one oxygen has not satisfied the octet rule because um, it only has six around it, and all the others have. So I'm gonna take these two electrons and I'm going to make a double bond here. So, I'm going to, so this oxygen I'm going to take off two electrons and in the process I'm going to make the single bond a double bond. Like so. Okay. So this is a valid structure for ozone. Okay. I have a double bond here and a single bond here. 
and just showing you. Here's our structure for ozone. Now they show it in a straight line like this in the, in the on the slide, but it's actually more correct with the angles I showed you in the picture before. But we haven't gotten to that part yet. So if I look at this model, there's really nothing special about the oxygen on one side versus the other. Okay, this double bond has just as like equal likelihood of forming here. So it's possible that the oxygen on the other side could have donated the electrons. And this side would have been a double, a single bond. Like that. So it's just an equal chance of the double bond being here versus here. Okay, so this is a situation that we was talking about in quantum mechanics where you have two events have equal likelihood of occurring. And we have no way of distinguishing which one is going to happen because the scenario is identical for both sides. So that's a case we have res a resonance, resonance structure. So... these two formulas have equal likelihood of occurring. So you can think of it as they rapidly go back and forth. So imagine if I had a, two, a film loop. I was just very rapidly going through the two versions of those two diagrams. The actual structure would be somewhere in between. Okay, so it almost looked like this, this, hat, this bond that's like half formed here or half formed here. And so you really can't tell which side is the double bond. It's, it's like th the structure is kind of a combination of these two extremes. And that's what, what, that's what a resonance structure is, okay? It's multiple versions of a structural formula that have equal likelihood of occurring. Okay. Here's another example with carbonate. Okay. I have a double bond. I have three oxygens around a central carbon, and only one of them is a double bond. Now, the three oxygens are identical. So, this double bond could be either here, here, or here. So, they all have equal likelihood of occurring. So, as a result, They all happen, and again, it's the true, true structure is going to be some combination of these two, or three, I should say. Okay. So, if I do that one, let's, let me show you another example. Um, this comes up a lot in you take biology. Let's see if I can draw this on the MR1 sheet. Let me reset. I'm going to add one. I eh, can't go beyond that. Never mind. We're not going to be able to show it. Um, okay. Different. Okay. Okay. So, okay. S2. Now, what are our resonance for this? Now, look at the periodic table on this. Sulfur is very full of oxygen. So, it's, it's going to have the same number of valence electrons as oxygen. So I can look at ozone 
as a model for SO2. Because it's just like similar to ozone, just replace one of those oxygens with sulfur, because sulfur and oxygen have the same number of valence electrons. So let's do that. I'm going to have the three structure, except the center one this time is going to be sulfur. And I have an oxygen here. And actually, I want to make. I'm going to put the sulfur on the end. No, I'm going to put the sulfur in the middle. And so one of them is a double bond, one of them is a single bond, and this oxygen has this has one. Okay. So, if you see in this case, it's really identical to ozone. The only difference is the center oxygen is sulfur instead of oxygen. Um, so the resonance structure is very similar. You have a double bond either going between the O and the S or between the other O and the S. And they both have equal likelihood of occurring. Okay. Now, there are going to be some exceptions to the octet rule. Um, one of the common, and this one of the common ones is going to be boron. Now, boron is element three. So there is a certain way that the electron orbitals will arrange themselves. And as a result, boron will actually be stable with only three electrons around it. Okay, So you can actually have a compound with boron. I'm going to make this boron. And we'll make this, let's just make it hydrogen. And hydrogen should only have, shouldn't have that many electrons. And we'll do the same for the other hydrogen. There we go. Make that hydrogen. Get rid of its electrons. Make that a single bond. Nope. Go that. And now this boron is going to have three. Now, if I look here, you normally would think this, well, this boron shouldn't be satisfied because it only has three bonds around it, and, bo and boron right now only has six electrons around it. But this boron is actually surprisingly stable. Um, it has to do with a particular arrangement of how the orbitals are going to interact with each other in this bond. And as a result, boron is, you're going to find very often boron forms a stable compound with only six valence electrons. Okay, so it's one of, just one of the examples of the exceptions to the octet rule. Now, once we get beyond the second principal energy level, Okay, we have available d orbitals and f orbitals, so it's possible those normally empty d or f orbitals can actually 
form expanded octets. So it's possible to have a valence shell for certain elements with 10, 12, or even 14 valence electrons around them. And in those cases, it's just the empty orbitals that would B, D, and F orbitals are being occupied. So, a common one is sulfur. Okay, so sulfur is right here. It's in the third shell. And you'll sometimes see compounds with sulfur that can have up to five, five single bonds around it. So let me just show you what that would look like. Sulfur and H. So this is actually another example of an exception to the octet rule. Is this SH5? Okay. Sulfur has five bonds around it, and again, it's it's more than eight. But with sulfur, this is an this is a stable compound. Okay. Violates the octet rule. But it will satisfy. It it is it ends up being stable. It's one of those again exceptions to the octet rule. Okay. Questions so far. No, no. Okay. Let's, all right, I want to get to Vesper theory. Now, if you've taken biology, you might have already been exposed to this. Vesper theory allows us to predict the shape of molecules based upon the number of electrons around a central atom. So it actually provides us a fairly simple and easy way to predict the shape of a complicated structure of a molecule just by following a few simple rules. And once we know the shape of it, that can actually help us to classify a molecule as being polar or nonpolar. Okay, so Vesper is a is just a theory. Okay, it's a it's like a it's a model. Um, so it stands for valence shell electron repulsion theory, and it allows us to predict the three dimensional shape of a set of atoms around a central atom by looking at the one dot formula. So what we do is we start with the electron dot formula for a molecule. And we count the number of pairs of electron groups. Okay. Now what, what an electron group is, is either going to be a single, double, or triple bond. Okay. A, each of those are going to count as one electron group. Okay, it's just a group of electrons being shared between two atoms. So it doesn't matter if it's a single bond, double bond, or triple bond. All cases, we're just going to count them, count that as a single electron group. The other set of electron groups in terms for the Vesper theory are going to be lone pairs of electrons that aren't being bonded. So what we do is we count the number of electron groups around a central atom. And we arrange them so they're going to be as far apart as possible. Okay. So according to this theory, the shape of the molecule is going to be determined by the number of electron groups around a central atom. So I'll take an example with two Vesper groups. Two, I'm sorry, two 
two electron groups or two electron vesper groups. So carbon dioxide. So if I look at the central carbon atom, I have two electron groups around it. Okay, this double bond is one group. This double bond is another group. And these two double bonds are going to try to arrange themselves to be as far apart as possible. So that means they're going to be at a full 180 degrees from each other. So, and you can actually see that with the Chem 101 tool. Um, I'll just reset this. Okay, so I take the central atom, which is red, and I put two electron groups around it. Now, it doesn't matter if these electron groups are single, double, or triple bonds. Okay, we count them the same. As long there's only two electron groups around the central atom. They're going to be arranged at a full 180 degrees from each other. They're going to try to get as far away from each other as possible. But with carbon dioxide, what you end up with is a linear molecule, okay? Because this group and this group are going to get as far away from each other as possible, which is, means they're going to end up at opposite sides of the atom. Okay. Now, if we have a central atom with three electron groups, they're still going to be as try to get as far away as po as possible, but that's going to result in them forming three 120 degree angles. So, what that would look like is so I go to this model and I add a third, no, not bond type, but no. Get under there. Right here. Okay. So now I have three electron groups around the central atom. Each of these is at 120 degrees. So when we have the, and this is actually in a plane. So we call trigonal. Okay, we mean, trigonal means three angles, one, two, three angles, and planar because the three angles are in the same plane. Okay, trigonal planar. And in a trigonal planar, since they're in the same plane, and you use 360 degrees in a circle, well, if we take 360 degrees and divide it by three, we get three sets of 120 degree angles. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter if it's three single bonds. Or what if one of these bonds was just a lone pair of electrons? So if I take off one of these bonds off the central atom, and I replace it with a lone pair, I still have three sets of electron groups around that central atom. It's the only difference, one of them is a lone pair. I still have the trigonal planar arrangement, one, two, three, and this angle is still 120 degrees. Okay. So this is a similar example, okay, SO2. If I look at the central atom, I have a lone pair here, another bond here, and another bond. So that's three electron groups. So the electron geometry is in trigonal planar. This, this bond is one end of the plane. 120 degrees from here is my bond here, and 120 degrees from here to here is another bond, and then approximately 120 degrees from here to here is my third angle. But if I just connect the dots between the atoms, okay, I go from here to here to here. So 
what this looks like is my original trigonal planar. I just took away one of the atoms. Okay, and what I'm left with is this bent shape. So, going back to the diagram. You notice when I took off that electron bond and just replaced it with one pair of electrons, they're still in a 120 degree angle. So it's imagine I took this bond off and replaced it with a lone pair of electrons. What's left over is a bent shape. Okay, so think of this. Okay, I start with a trigonal planar. I replace this top bond with a pair of electrons. So I take off the bond and replace it with a pair of electrons. This angle still is 120 degrees. And this angle here is 120 degrees, and this angle here is 120 degrees. But if I just connect the dots between the three atoms, I end up with a bent molecule. And it's bent because of the repulsion of this lone pair of electrons and the repulsion from these two bonds pushing against each other. And the three groups are still trying to get away from each other. Does everyone see how this arrangement is similar to the original trigonal planar, this arrangement, okay? I just took this atom off and replaced it with electrons, but the repulsion is still there. So I still have the same basic shape, just without this top on it. And what was original trigonal planar became bent, but the angles are still the same. So any questions on that? No. Okay. Okay, the fourth shape this is where we have four electron groups around a central atom. So take methane, okay, CH4. Okay, I have four electron groups. Now, usually, again, when you you can't really tell when you're just push, putting it on a flat surface. Everything looks like it's 90 degrees. But if I look at this three-dimensional model, Okay, this kind of, and this actually looks like if I like to think of it as like a tripod with three legs and the neck on a camera. And the angle between each of these is 109 degrees. Okay, so this is how four electron groups are going to try to get away from each other. Okay, they're going to form this tripod shape, which we refer to as a tetrahedral shape. So I think so think of a tripod like a camera with three legs and then the neck where a camera would be. Okay, so if the neck is here, the, I'd stick the camera on the neck and then I'd have the three legs holding it up. Okay. That's that would be an analogy to a tetrahedral shape. So normally when you're drawing it on paper, they want to show when something's coming out of the plane of the paper or going into the plane of the paper. So you'll see this wedge-shaped bond to indicate the bond is coming out of the plane of the paper and a dashed bond to indicate it's going into the plane of the paper. And if it's drawn with a straight line, just means it's in the same plane of the paper. So that's a little trick to show, illustrate a three-dimensional structure on a two-dimensional surface. So in the diagram, Going back to the one on one. 
chunk. So if I add a fourth group, they kind of show it. Okay. But, so you think of this bond is coming out of the plane, and this bond is going into the plane. They don't show the dash, but they kind of give the illusion. And this bond angle, if I measure the angle between the two bonds, and these are both in the same plane, this is actually 109 degrees. And actually, if I could rotate the atom and measure them in the same plane, those other angles would be 109 degrees as well. So all these bonds are equal distance from each other in this four in this trigon tetrahedral shape. Now, if I start taking bonds off and replacing one with lone pairs, there's other shapes I can form that are derived from this tetrahedral shape. So I'll show you an example. Now here's nitrogen, and this is actually um, NH3, which is ammonia. So I have, still have four electron groups. I have a, a lone pair here, so that's one group. I have a, a single bond here, a single bond here, and a single bond here. That's four electron groups. So the electron groups are going to arrange themselves in a tetrahedral geometry. Okay, with the lone pair up here and the three bonds here. But so the shape is going to be just like the tetrahedral, but I took one of the atoms off and I didn't adjust and just replaced it with this lone pair of electrons. So it's not, there's no atom up here. But the repulsion from the lone pair of electrons remains. And so this lone pair is still trying to get push against these three other electrons and still resulting in keeping the other bonds in the same get same relative configuration to each other. So what so I end up is a tetrahedral with the neck taken off. And as a result, this is what we call a trigonal pyramidal shape. So, go back to that model here. I start take the tetrahedron. I'm just going to take the top, but the repulsion remains because I'm going to take remove this bond, and I'm going to replace it with a pair of electrons. So the repulsion remains, and what I have up with is this trigonal planar. I'm sorry, trigonal. I'm sorry, I, I should have said trigonal pyramidal. Okay. Trigonal planar would be. That's a trigonal planar. This is trigonal pyramid. Okay, three angles in a pyramid shape. Like so. Okay, and again, they should have the wedge in it, the ball coming out of the plane of the screen or the paper, and then this dash is the wedge going into the plane of the paper. And again, the angle is still about 100, 109 degrees. Now, if you look at the book, they'll, they'll say it's slight, the angle between these two bonds is slightly less than 109 degrees because a lone pair has greater repulsion than electrons being shared because the electrons are around one atom. So what you'll find is these angles are pushed a slightly closer together than in a true trigonal planar. So if you look it up, you'll find that the, it's slightly less than 109 degrees because a lone pair of electrons has greater repulsion than electrons being bonded. Which makes sense because they're not being shared. They all the repulsion is around that one atom. Okay, question. What well, let's say if I had an atom with four electron groups, but I just took off another electron bond here. 
and replaced it with a, a second long pair. So I'd end up with a structure with two pairs of lone pair electrons and two bonds. What would you predict that shape to be? Okay, so I took this pyramidal, plucked off one of the bonds, didn't arrange the other electrons because I'm replacing it with a pair of electrons. What would that shape be? I want to guess. Okay, square. And what else? Want to take a guess? Okay, I see a bent. Okay, let's look at this. I want to start here. I'm going to take off a bond. And I'm going to replace it with another pair of electrons. So it's tetrahedral. If I look at the, compare all the bonds themselves, but I only have two bonds. So this is what shape molecule? Anyone? Is it bent? Okay, triangle. Well, it's not really, we don't say triangle because triangle is three sides, but it's um. You're on the right track. It, yeah, it is, it is kind of triangular, but we refer to that as bent again. Okay, so who said bent before it was? Yep, Gabriel, you're right. You call it bent, but it is different from the trigonal planar bent. Okay, so this angle is a little under around 109 degrees. Now look what happens when I take off two of the electrons. I keep the two bonds and I take off the pair of electrons. Okay, see what happened to the angle? I still have a bent, but this is a bent based upon the trigonal planar, and this angle is 120 degrees. When there's four electron groups, it's bent, but it's the bent based upon the tetrahedral shape. So this angle is around 109 degrees. You can see it as I adjust it, see how the angle gets bigger? I add that pair of electrons, it creates greater repulsion, it pushes these together. So this is, again, 109 degrees with a little bit, they push slightly less than 109 degrees because the repulsion of the lone pairs is greater than the repulsion of the uh, angle of the bonded angles. So we call it, we still call it, this is bent, but it's 109 degree bent versus 120 degree bent. Or the bent based upon the tetrahedral bent versus the uh, trigonal bent. Okay, so this is what water is. Okay, if I look at the water molecule, there's four electron groups around oxygen, two lone pairs of electrons, two bonded electrons. The electron groups have a tetrahedral geometry, but I, two of them are bonds, so and two only two and two of them are pa lone pairs. So what's left over is that bent shaped but it's the 109 degree bent. So you have to distinguish when, you, there'll be questions when you, they're asking you about the bent, you'll have to distinguish which bent you're referring to, the 109 bent or 120 degree bent. Okay. So here's all the examples of the molecular shape. So they're gonna be determined on the initi you initially look at the number of electron groups you have, and then the number of bonds around that central atom. Okay, so if I have 
two electron groups, they're going to arrange themselves at 180 degrees, so I have a linear molecule. If I have three electron groups, they're going to be trigonal planar. If I have three electron groups and only two atoms are bonded, so I can imagine this trigonal planar, you just pluck off one of the atoms, but don't move the other atoms around. I end up with this 120 degree bent shape. Okay, move up to four electron groups. I start with the tetrahedral, like on CH4. I, if I have a tetrahedral with only three bonded atoms and one lone pair, I end up with the trigonal pyramidal. And I have start with four electron groups, but only two bonded atoms. I end up with the 109 degree bent version. And there's a couple other variations if you're looking at, those are the main ones you're going to think about because those are all within the octet rules, but there's a couple other geometries once we get outside of the octet rule. Okay. So this one is similar to the trigonal planar, but then I put it's a combination between the trigonal planar and a linear. So you have three bonds that are in the same plane at 120 degrees. And then 90 degrees from that, I have a bond on top and a bond on, bo and bond on the bottom. So it's kind of like the shape of like a uh, jack. If you're playing, you used to play jacks as a kid, that's kind of the shape of that. And then there's this version with six where you have four bonds in the same plane. So it's almost like they're at 90 degrees to each other. And then two, and then two, one at the top and one on the bottom. Okay. Those aren't really going to come up a whole lot because those are the one, weird ones that are exceptions to the octet rule. OK. So again, We've kind of gone through this, just to summarize. When you're trying to predict molecular shapes of the Vesper theory, first thing you always need is the electron dot formula. Okay. Then you've got to arrange your electron groups around the central atoms. The central atoms are just the atoms with that are bonded to other atoms, and they're bonded to more than one central atom. And you're just going to minimize the repulsion. And then use the central atoms, bonded central atom, to determine the shape. Okay. So, Vesper theory to predict the shape of N2O, I want to start with the electron dot formula. And if I look at the central atom here, how many electron groups are there? Around that central region. And remember, single, double, and triple bonds all count as one group. So how many groups around that central nitrogen? Heard, oops, heard one answer. Any other, anyone else guessing? Let's see. I heard another guess. Okay, well, let's go over and see what you guessed. All right, so I see. I see uh, four, one, two, and three. Okay, remember double bonds count as one group, single bonds count as one group. Triple bonds count as one group, and lone pairs count as one group. So we're not counting electrons, we're counting Vesper groups. So if I go back to that diagram, this nitrogen has a double bond here, a double bond there. How many groups is that around that central nitrogen?
look at the central nitrogen, one, two. Okay, there's two and only two groups around the central nitrogen. I'm not talking about this nitrogen or this oxygen, I'm just talking about the central atom. It's one group here, one group there. Each double bond is a single electron group. So I have two groups. They're going to try to get away from each other as far apart as possible. So they're going to be opposite ends of the nitrogen atom. Okay. We don't worry about the geometry around atoms that are only bonded to one other atom because it, it, there's, no, there's only one way. It, there's, there's no geometry to just worry about. It's only when you have multiple atoms around a central atom. That's where the geometry comes in. Okay, so this, this, they're on opposite ends of each other. It's going to be linear. Okay. If I have a single atom bonded to another single atom, they only, they, they has to be linear. There's no other way I can do it. But when you have more than two atoms around a central atom, that's where you have to worry about the geometry. Okay, and that's this case. One group here, one group here. 100 degrees makes it a linear molecule. Okay. State the number of electron groups, lone pairs, and bond and atoms, and use Vesper theory to determine the shapes of the following molecules. Okay. I'll kind of walk through these. Okay. PF3. Now, phosphorus is going to be very similar to nitrogen. Okay. So, as a model for PF3, I would look at NH3. In this case, with the phosphorus, a similar nitrogen, it would have four electron groups around it. Three bonded atoms, one lone pair. So if I try to draw that one on the screen, PF3. Okay, P. I'm going to have three bonds and a lone pair. Okay. And then each of these are fluorines. Okay, and each of the fluorines would have start with seven electrons. So I already give it one, one so I'm going to add the other six. Like that. Okay. So then to determine the structure, I just look at the central atom. Okay. I have three pairs of electrons around the phosphorus that are being bonded, and then a lone pair. So this is like NH3, and what I have is trigonal planar. Okay, H2S, well, I don't have to go into too much detail now, because if you look at S, it's right below O on the uh, the periodic table. So H2S is pretty much its electron dot formula is going to look just like H2O. Okay, so it's going to you're going to have your four electron groups around the sulfur, two bonded groups, two lo a lone pair, and it's going to have a bent arrangement. CCl4 that's just like CH4. Okay, tetrahedral. And PO4. Now that's a trickier one. So PO4 would look like this. I'm going to replace these phosphoruses, make them oxygens. And I'm going to add one more. 
take away so many oxygens. And Okay, so let's start off with PO4. Okay, so phosphorus is similar to nitrogen in that it has five electrons around it. So I want to give two electrons to one of the oxygens. So I have two electrons here from the phosphorus, and it's sharing them with the single oxygen, and that oxygen is satisfied. I have the other three pairs is going to be sharing electrons with these oxygens. So if you see right now, these oxygens still need some electrons to satisfy their outermost shell. And I should actually have it like that, that, and that. Okay. So normally, three oxygens and one phosphorus would have... Um, Six times three plus five electrons. So that would be 23. Okay. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And I have too many. Okay. Okay, now, now I'm right. So, what happens is, notice this is 3 minus, so I'm going to add in 3 electrons to each of these separate oxygens. And that brings a charge up to minus 3. Like that. And now, this whole thing has a charge of minus 3. So normally I would put brackets around it to give it a charge if I were able to. Now if I look at this arrangement, it's tetrahedral. Okay. Because I have four electron groups around that central phosphorus. They're going to arrange themselves in a tetrahedral geometry. Okay. The last thing I want to cover is polarity of bonds and molecules. So not all bond, valent bonds are equal. Okay. In certain cases, you can have a bond where you're evenly sharing electrons or unevenly sharing electrons. So if the bonds are formed with identical atoms, Equal, the identical atoms have equal pull on the electrons. The electrons are going to be shared evenly. However, if there are different elements and one of those atoms has a stronger pull or attraction for the electrons, the electrons between those covalent bonds are going to be shared unequally. And when that happens, you have a charge differential around the bond, and we refer to that as a polar bond. Okay, so I, electronegativity, I mentioned this last week, is just the ability of an atom to attract electrons. So elements that form positive ions have a very low electronegativity because they want to give away their electrons. And atoms that want to become negative have a very high electronegativity. They're going to want to attract electrons. So this is why we see for nonmetals and 
electrons that form negative ions have higher electronegativities and lower metals have lower electronegativities. And I want to find as we go down the periodic table, because of the extra layers of electrons between the valence shell and the nucleus are going to lower the electronegativity because they interfere with the attraction of the nucleus. So if we look at the periodic table, we can see that electronegativity tends to increase as you go from left to the right, meaning as you go from metal to nonmetal, and it decreases as you go down. And so here's just a simple diagram. Some elements in the electronegativities, and you can see as you go from left to electronegativity decreases, and as you go from top to bottom, electronegativity gets smaller. Okay, as a valence shells get further away from the nucleus, they're less likely to attract electrons to it because of the interference of the lower levels of electrons and the distance away from the nucleus. It gets bigger and bigger. Okay. So, how does that relate to covalent bonds? So, we can look at the type, we can actually use electronegativity to predict the type of bond that will form between two atoms. So, there's actually three main categories of bonds. We can have either a covalent bond where the electrons are being shared evenly. We refer to this as a nonpolar covalent bond. We have a polar covalent bond where bonds are being shared unequally. And then we meant, no, we have ionic bonds where there is no sharing and one electron, one is being grabbed by the other element and the other atom has its electrons being stripped from it, ionic. So, if we can, we're going to use electronegativity to ca calculate whether, what type of bond we get. So if we look at the electronegativity of two different elements, if we say, and we subtract and find the difference between the electronegativities, that difference is going to tell us what type of bond it is. So, we look at the, this case. Okay. Take nitrogen and nitrogen. Well, if I, they, it's the same element. So, they have, obviously, the difference between the two is going to be zero. So, if the electronegativity is zero or close to zero, in those cases, the electrons are going to be shared evenly, and we have a nonpolar covalent. Okay, so there's another example chlorine and bromine. Very small difference in the electronegativity. If I subtract it, it's 0.2. And as long as you're between 0 and 0.4, okay, we'll, we'll consider that a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, if we're in a middle range of when the electronegativity difference is 0.5 to 1.7, in that range, we're going to have uneven sharing of electrons. So look at this nitrogen or chlorine to carbon bond. Okay, chlorine has electronegativity of 3, and carbon has 2.5. I find the difference. It's 0.5, so it's within that middle range. We want to refer to that as a polar covalent bond. Okay, meaning there's uneven sharing of electrons. Now, if the difference is greater than 0.7, there's no sharing, and we have what we have there is ionic bond. Okay. Okay, so hydrogen, hydrogen, obviously they have the same electronegativity. Bonds are shared evenly. Hydrogen chlorine, chlorine has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So the difference is in that middle range. It's not high enough to make it ionic, so there's still sharing of electrons, but the hydrogen has a weaker attraction 
compared to chlorine. So chlorine is trying to pull, being all selfish, and the electrons are spending more of their time around the chlorine and less of the time around the oxygen. So that means this bond has a charge differential. The side of the bond near chlorine is more negative, and the size of the bond near hydrogen is more positive. So we have what we call a polar covalent bond. There's still sharing, but there's unequal or uneven sharing. Okay. So bonds are going to become more polar as the difference in electronegativity increases. And when we have that separation of bond around a pole or covalent bond, we're going to refer to that as a dipole. And usually there's two ways we can represent it. You can use the, you see these little lowercase delta symbols. Okay. D, delta, and Greek letter D, it's usually symbol for difference. Instead of using the triangle, capital D, we use the lower D. And so delta positive, delta negative indicates as a charge differential. Or the other way is you can represent it with an arrow. And there's going to be a plus sign at one end of the arrow indicating where the positive charge are. And then the direction is going to indicate where the electrons are being pulled. So this is going to be the negative side. OK. So as long as that electronegativity is in that 0.5 to 1.7 range, so again, we're finding the difference in their electronegativity between elements. And if the difference is between 0.5 and 1.7, we're considering that polar covalent. If it's between, if it's zero to one to zero point four, we have equal sharing. We're going to consider that nonpolar covalent. And if we're above one point seven, we're not even having no sharing. It's ionic. Okay, so here's just another gram. Okay, showing the different ranges and their cutoff points. Okay, so zero to up to and including point four. We have even sharing, covalent nonpolar, greater than 0.4 to up to 1.8, uneven sharing, and then 1.8 and higher, ionic. Okay, so again, it's just. When you're looking at electronegativity, you're just going to look that up. That's going to either be on a table or a, a list of values, and you just subtract electronegativity. There's no way to calculate the electronegativity by itself. It's just something that you'd look up. But then once you have the electronegativities for the two elements, you just find the difference and then look at the difference, and that determines the whether, what type of bond you have there. Okay. So this is pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, so we use the polarity to determine whether a whole molecule is nonpolar. And so in a nonpolar molecule can happen from either one or two conditions. Either obviously if there's no polar bonds, the molecule is nonpolar. Or if the bonds are polar, but they cancel each other out. So you have polar bonds, but they're pointed in opposite directions. Then the opposite ends of the molecule have no difference in charge. You Then you have a nonpolar molecule as well. Okay. So this case, this is all the, fir the first situation. Hydrogen hydrogen bonds, chlorine chlorine bonds obviously are nonpolar because they're the same. And hydrogen carbon bonds are also nonpolar. Okay. And you'll find that when substances are nonpolar, 
they only mix with other nonpolar substances. So you find like um, paint, paint thinners or oils. Oils tend to be nonpolar. And water is a polar molecule, which is, so that's why oil and water don't mix because water is polar and oil is nonpolar. Find that very often that polar molecules will mix with other polar molecules and nonpolar will mix with other nonpolars, but nonpolar and polar molecules don't mix well together. Okay. So here's an example carbon dioxide. Now carbon oxygen bonds are very polar. But look at the shape of the molecule. Okay, it's linear. So the two dipoles are pulling at each other in opposite directions. So at, if I compare this end of the molecule to this end of the molecule, it's the same. Okay, this end of the molecule is at the tip of the arrow. This end of the molecule is at the tip of the arrow. So there's no difference between the two sides of the molecule. Their dipoles are canceling each other out. It's like two people playing tug of war, pulling with equal force. The dipoles cancel each other out. So when the, if you do have dipoles, but they cancel each other out, means the molecule itself is also nonpolar. Now here's another example. Carbon tetrachloride. Now, this is tetrahedral shaped molecule, and carbon chlorine bonds are polar. But again, they're all pulling in opposite directions. Okay, in this case, if you have equal forces on a tetrahedral molecule pulling in all opposite directions, it's going to cancel each other out again. So this molecule. Even though it contains polar bonds, it's nonpolar. Okay. So to have a polar molecule, two things have to occur. You must have polar bonds. Okay, if, this, if you don't have any polar bonds, you stop right there. You're nonpolar. But you have to have polar bonds, and the polar bonds cannot cancel each other out. So when you're looking at bonds with more than one electron group, okay, you have to look at the geometry to determine if the bonds are going to cancel each other out. Okay, if it's just a single bond and between two atoms and it's polar, there's nothing for it to cancel out, so it's automatically a polar molecule. Okay, but let's look at okay, a simple example. Okay, HCl. Hydrogen chlorine, we, if we calculate the electronegativity difference, we're going to find this is a polar molecule because we have a single polar bond and it's nothing for it to cancel out. Okay, it's just a, like a single force pulling in one direction, there's nothing to cancel it out. So the, you have one bond that's polar, the molecule is polar. If I look at water, here I have two polar bonds, and they're pushing towards that oxygen, not canceling each other out. Okay, they actually combine to make a combined dipole, which looks like this. Okay, it's just like if I pushed on, a, had someone push it on this way in a box, I'm pushing on this way a box. This would be the direction the box would. Okay, so this direction and this direction combine to make this direction. So they're not canceling each other out. So as a result, water is polar. If water was straight with the same bonds but it had a linear shape, it would be nonpolar. Because if I compare to Carbon dioxide, similar size as water, but I have polar bonds just like water does. But because they're, this is a linear molecule, the two 
polar bonds cancel each other out. Whereas with water, because it's bent like that, the two bonds do not cancel each other out and end up with a polar molecule. Okay. Similar situation with ammonia. Okay. NH3, okay, if I calculate hydrogen nitrogen bonds are polar, and because of this geometry, in this trigonal pyramidal, the three bonds are pushing together towards the nitrogen. They're not canceling each other out. Okay, because of the angle to each other. Now if this if I if this was a trigonal planar, I had three bonds in the same plane pushing towards nitrogen. They would cancel each other out. Okay, but because this is pyramidal, the three bonds are not canceling each other out. Okay, you can always test it by just imagining forces pushing in that direction. Are they gonna is it gonna be like a tug of war where there's no motion, or are they gonna go in the same direction? In this case, they're gonna combine to make a force going this way. Okay. So if when you're looking at a molecule to determine if it's polar. We first have to, again, determine if the bonds are polar covalent or non-polar covalent. If, the, if there, you can't find a polar bond in the molecule, then you're done. You know the, bond, the molecule has to be non-polar. So then, if you find polar covalent bonds, then you have to look at the electron dot and formula and its geometry. Once you have the geometry, Determine if the polar bonds are canceling each other out. If they're not canceling each other out, then you have a polar molecule. Okay. So here's an example, OF2. Okay, determine if it's polar or nonpolar. So first thing I want to do is look at the bond themselves. I have OF bonds. So if I look at the oxygen has electronegativity of 3.5, and again, I would just look that up. Fluorine has electronegativity of 4. I, the difference is 0.5, and 0.5 is just above that range, but we're putting it in the polar covalent range. So we do have polar covalent bonds. So we met one of the conditions for it to be polar. It must have polar covalent bonds. Second condition is we have to determine whether or not they cancel each other out. So if I look at the geometry, okay, this is very similar to water. Okay, it's a bent molecule. I have two polar bands at bonds at this angle pulling on each other. They're not canceling each other out. As a result, this OF2 molecule is considered polar. Okay. So remember to sum up a polar molecule must have polar bonds, and the polar bonds cannot cancel each other out. And to, you have to look at the geometry to determine whether or not those bonds cancel each other out. Okay. Questions it's up to this point? No. Okay. Okay, just last section I want to cover last few minutes. Um give you a little bit of a summary of all the we talked about these intermolecular force. 
So once we have compounds, there's a lot of different forces that determine how strong the attraction is between different molecules. And this is what's going to determine whether a compound or a substance is a gas at room temperature, a liquid, or a solid. Okay, so substances that have very strong attractions between molecules are going to be obviously more likely to be solids at room temperature, and substances that have weak attractions between each other are going to be more likely to be gases. So the three main forces that are going to have attractions are dipole-dipole attractions. Hydrogen bonding, which is a very specific type of interaction between polar molecules. And the third is dispersion forces. OK. So a dipole-dipole attraction is just any case where you have two, a polar molecule. And because polar molecules have a positive and negative end, they're going to be attracted to the positive end of another polar molecule. So if I look at something like HCl, HCl is polar, so it's going to have an attraction towards other hydrochloric acid, uh, HCl um, molecules. Okay. See the same thing with ammonia and water. But with ammonia and water, it's a little different. Okay. Ammonia, whenever you have an interaction between a hydrogen atom and a very electronegative atom, like fluorine, nitrogen, or oxygen. So these are strongly electronegative atoms, uh, atoms near the top and right of the periodic table that have high electronegativities. They're going to have an extra strong pull on hydrogen. And here's what happens. Now, what's so special about hydrogen that it, it has a strong attraction? Well, when hydrogen is in a bond, hydrogen's the only element that it has can bond, but only has a single layer of electrons. So when the hydrogen bonds, this whole side is has a completely exposed nucleus. Okay? All the other atoms have layers of uh, non-valence electrons between the outermost layer and the nucleus. Hydrogen doesn't have that. So when hydrogen forms a polar or covalent bond, the other side of the atom is a naked nucleus. It's just a nucleus completely exposed to the outside. That creates a strong positive attraction. And if you have another element that also has a very high electronegativity, it forms an extra strong polar attraction between these two molecules. Okay? That extra strong polar attraction is referred to as the hydrogen bond. Okay, it's extra strong. It's stronger than your regular dipole-dipole attractions. Okay. Now, these hydrogen bonds form in water and ammonia. This is why water, even though it's such a tiny molecule and light molecule, it's a, it's a liquid at room temperature. If I look at other molecules of similar sizes, like carbon dioxide, oxygen, they're all gases. But because water has a strong, from these strong hydrogen and oxygen bonds, water is a liquid at room temperature and has a, a very high boiling point compared to other substances of similar size. If water molecule was straight, it would be a gas at room temperature. It would have a very low boiling point. It would just evaporate. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have liquid water on Earth. But because it's bent and because it forms these strong hydrogen bonds, water is liquid at room temperature. And it's also why, because of this interaction between the hydrogen bonds, it 
it causes water to actually expand when it freezes um, because of how these water molecule forms crystals. Most substances do not expand when they freeze. Most substances actually get smaller and contract when they freeze. But water expands, which is, again, a very usual characteristic for a substance. And this is why in the wintertime, lakes form ice, ice at the top and not at the bottom. Okay, if I took another substance that was a liquid, like just like some an oil or a benzene or any other substance that was a liquid and froze it, you would find the it would freeze from the bottom up. But water freezes from the top down, and that's because of the hydrogen bonds interacting with forming these extra strong bonds between the each other. Okay. So we took the two types of dipole attractions. The weakest is just your regular dipole dipole attraction between polar molecules. The second one is when you have hydrogen combined interacting with a very electronegative element like fluorine nitrogen oxygen. You form an extra strong dipole dipole attraction, which we call a hydrogen bond. Um, you might have seen hy hydrogen bonds are important in DNA. They, they actually hold the, the base pairs of DNA together, if you take in biology. And they actually are partially one of the interactions responsible for protein folding. Okay, and when amino acids fold to make the secondary structure of proteins, that's, that's, uh, that's from hydrogen bonding. Okay, dispersion forces are very weak attractive forces. They, they occur between nonpolar molecules. So how can a nonpolar molecule have dispersion, have attraction forces? Well, it's because the electrons are very rapidly moving around the atom. At, at any one point, just by pure chance, you could have a temporary dipole because the electrons could just happen to be at one end of a one molecule and interact with another molecule that has a temporary dipole. And it's just because of the random motion of the electrons. You get these temporary dipoles. It just exists for a brief moment because of the random motion of the molecules. And this is, this is why nonpolar molecules can still be liquids. Okay, like oils and um, benzene, even though they're nonpolar, that those dispersion forces create a very brief attraction that allow them to exist as liquids at low enough temperatures. Okay. Now, just above that, in terms of attractions, are ionic bonds. Now, ionic bonds are not, we don't consider ionic compounds molecules, but the attraction between ions in a ionic formula is exceptionally strong. And this is why salts uh, have very high melting points, because the ionic bond, when they're in that crystal shape, they take a lot of energy to actually break down the, the crystals. And you'll see, I'll kind of sum this up. So what you'll tend to see is substances that have hydrogen bonding taking place tend to have higher boiling points. And substances that just have dipole attractions tend to have higher boiling points and melting points than nonpolar compounds. So here is just an example. These are alkanes carbon compounds, and they're all nonpolar. And you can see the heavier molecules have higher boiling points because it just takes more energy to separate heavy molecules. But relatively speaking, they all have pretty low boiling points. Once I start getting into the range of compounds with 
hydrogen bonds and dipole-dipole attractions, you see, on average, the boiling point is higher. So, so these are, look at the average boiling in this, these dipole-dipole molecules compared to the boiling point, average boiling point in these nonpolar molecules. This is a higher average than these molecules. Then if I look at compounds with hydrogen bonds, the average melting point when boiling point here is higher than the dipole and addition forces. And then if I go all the way up to ionic bonds, which are really strong forces, um, they have very high melting and boiling points. Now the only thing that would have higher boiling points is and melting points is that is what we call network solids. And those are huge crystals like diamond that are held together by a covalent bonding. Okay, it's like, so diamond, for example, is a, you can almost think of a diamond as a giant molecule. It's just, it's a huge grid of carbon atoms that are held together by covalent bonding. So, so imagine a giant carbon structure. that is built of just covalent bonds. So a diamond, you can think of a diamond as a giant molecule. It's because it's, it's all carbon, all held together by covalent bonding. That's why diamonds are the hardest known substance and it has a very high melting and boiling point. It's a lot of energy to break, crack a diamond. And with Diamonds, we, I mean, it is, we, it's similar to, a, we don't really like to call it a molecule at that point, because it's just, we would refer to it as either a network solid or a polymer, because it's a repeating giant molecule compound instead of atoms covalently bonded together. But you can think of it as a giant molecule. Okay. Um, so I think I'm and okay, we're right at the time. So the, the last section was just um, relating some of these interactions in amino acids and proteins. I won't, I'm not going to put that on the test, but it's just if you take in biology, it's kind of an interesting points to look through. Okay, so this is the last of the new material. So I will take a look at the homework I posted for tonight. Um, I will post the two exams by. Thursday, I would suggest to do the untimed one first, just because it will help you for the timed one, and and there's no time limit on that. And make sure you have both exams done by Wednesday. I'll set the due time to be Wednesday at 10 p.m., so just make sure you have them done and submitted by then. Um, and then I should be able to, I should have the averages posted by the end of the week okay um and again when you uh, i'm not i'm not I have no concerns about everyone especially people who have been regularly coming into the class so if you've been showing up regularly and completing all the assignments you don't really have to worry about your grade um just make sure i'm w w once i have the averages graded in the homeworks um Oh, okay, the exams will be posted Thursday of this week because I, I have to have them in grades done by uh, Thursday of next week. So I'll post them this Thursday, and then you'll have until next Wednesday to complete them. Um, so that will be the week from tomorrow. So that will be the 10 o'clock on the 13th It will be when they have to be done by. Um I can sign in next Tuesday. It's, I mean, I have no new material to bring up, um, so I will. I'll show up if you if people have questions. I can't really help specifically on the exam, but if there's questions on homework problems or stuff, I can walk you through that. I'm not going to obviously help you with test exam questions because that's just your assessment. Um, but what I'll do this Thursday is. I'm, since I'm posting the exams this Thursday, I'll do an optional session Thursday at 7. Um, I'm not going to present any new material, but if you have questions on 
any of the homework problems up to that point, I can definitely walk through those and help you out with those before you start the exams. Um, so I'll do that this week. And let's see, I'll, I will, I'm going to post the grades in on the, should have them in on the queue by next Thursday, but double check on Blackboard because the official grades are on Blackboard. I calculate the averages on Blackboard. So just make sure when you look at the average on Blackboard, it's consistent with what's in the book. I try to double check them, but I don't want to make, I don't want to, it's, when you put in the grades in, it's very easy to just adjusting the arrow up and down. It Sometimes a grade can be changed without me knowing it. So just double check. When you get your averages, double check the Blackboard grade in the grade and just make sure it's consistent because I don't want to cheat anyone out of a grade. Um, I double check on myself, but mistakes happen. And I, the grades don't automatically transfer from Blackboard from the... Um, from Blackboard into the queue. I have to take the averages from Blackboard manually, enter them into the queue, and it's so, sometimes the interface doesn't work or something doesn't click right. And so I, it's, I try to double check it, but it's it's common that a mistake can be made. So just double, do me a favor and just double check your grades to make sure you're not getting cheated on that. Um, but I'll, So I'll have the grades posted on Blackboard and then in the queue should have them by next Thursday. So I think everyone's had, I think, thank you all. I think you've all done well, especially a very difficult semester. Um, I think it's worked out well, despite what we've had to deal with. Um, so good luck for studying, good luck on all of your exams. Um, I think you may have seen that, I know the college has already determined that summer one is still going to be done virtually but they they're planning on making summer two opening the campus for that but it's going to be dependent on how well this how well the numbers with the coronavirus go down um but the the current plan is for the college to have summer two be uh, uh live classes in-person classes so uh no other questions uh have a, a good night. I'll stick on for a few minutes if people have uh, questions. So thank you all for your help. Uh, been a great class and good luck. <laughs>